and that's exactly what happened. Arctic Slope had um, a lot of leaders that were very well known, and of course, being the landowner borough, I mean that that's your territory. Well, how are they feeling about all these numbers that were floating around? And mm -hmm. I, I thank you for your comments. You, you mentioned Venice. To this day, we still use Venice Feldman Law Firm really? in Washington. Wise decision. Wise. And Bill Venice and, and that group. And, and Nelly, to your comment that I, I looked at a letter that was signed by then president of Arctic Slope Native Association prior to the creation of ASRC in the North Slope Borough, where Etuk was the executive director and dated December 18, 1971, to the president of the United States of America, the Honorable Richard M. Nixon. And the first line is that he calls for in the strongest possible terms to veto the Alaska Land Claim Settlement Act passed by Congress on December 14th of 1971. You mentioned the numbers, if I could, mm -hmm. of 40 million. Our land claim was for 56 and a half million acres just in the North Slope. And, and at the same time, that I was working, you're very exactly right, in Prudhoe Bay, that the, the leases had been sold 400,000 acres to the oil industry for $900 million without anybody asking us or telling us, how do you do? So in the sense of use and occupancy, our leaders had a very very strong belief and conviction that this is ours. The U.S. Constitution says so. And, and that we were very fortunate to have the people that we had as our leaders back then who literally led good chunks of the Land Claim Settlement Act. And the, uh, what I didn't mention in my roustabout days was the, the humongous amount of money I was making back then. It was $4.18 an hour. And that was big. Less than a year later, I got a big increase. And then I, this was when I thought I was feeling like a millionaire must feel. I was making $5.19 an hour. But at the same time, while I was enjoying having a, a, a job to help support uh, what, what I was doing. The issues just kept being in my mind that I was working for all these firms on doing something that wasn't right, that nobody said yes. And you mentioned the AFN and Nelly, the, act, uh, the differences that were there. I mentioned that within our own people the differences were there. There was, but you're exactly right, that they had the good sense to understand that we must come to some agreement somewhere. And there's no question that that uh, trans Alaska Pipeline wouldn't have happened without the settlement of the land claims. And, and to this day, our region continues to feel that we were shortchanged by a big, big amount. And, and while we don't dwell on it, we still say something that was inherently ours was given away. So I, I uh, looked at this letter almost 40 years ago now and on the and this is available on the web by the way that uh, the statement made back then by by the leaders of Arctic Slope Native Association which was created by the way to deal with the impending land claims that he said back then the Inupiaq Eskimos of the Arctic Slope hold Aboriginal title 
to perhaps the most valuable land on the North American continent. And that was 40 years ago. And, and I'm just so impressed, I, I sometimes can't fathom how our leaders, some of whom never got to be on high school, much less reaching high school, were able to do what they were able to do and deal with the complexities because nobody knew about corporation, nobody knew about the levels of government that, that we were about to deal with and we didn't know how to deal with them. But to, uh, the, the funding for all of this, when the communication that Tim mentioned, we didn't even have enough money to send anybody anywhere. And that's how poor we were. And the church, the Presbyterian church, largely funded our effort on the north to uh, get our land claim settled and and keep the the uh, Arctic Slope Native Association going and and that's where a big chunk of what we were able to do happened and once the funding was there somehow I don't know that it's innate but our people were able to pick the the right areas and I mentioned Bill Van Ness. You mentioned somebody up there like Native. Bill Van Ness was a key to a big part of our success on having to learn in super fast time what we needed to deal with and, and just get an idea how to deal with it. So maybe I'm getting off topic a little bit, but uh, no question that we, the Arctic Slope, were responsible also for the delay in agreeing to the land claims. We told AFN no. Everybody is getting is is not getting their fair share. And you mentioned the the uh, state uh, statehood act section four. This was the basis of our arguments that section four of the statehood act said you're going to be paid in kind for the value of your land and we never were and and we just our our leaders had a had the skill and the know-how to get to what we call the mung the root of the issue which was based in the u.s constitution and in the constitution of the state of alaska saying that the state of alaska did not follow their own own laws own rules and we had to go all the way when we tried to create the borough by the way I, I'm getting it's ahead okay. of myself but uh, fundamentally our leaders never wavered from their belief as first users and occupants of the land that all basis of law is based on was a fundamental right that we would not waver from. So to this day, that issue is still there and I noticed in some of the questions that now about offshore, that, that uh, again, use and occupancy is still an issue to this day. Mm -hmm. That uh, but I, I, I want to wait now and get to that. I want to, I want to reinforce, I want to reinforce this because he's saying something that's very, very, very important in the dynamic of what happened within the Native community. They were the odd man out. North Slope was really the, and, and Mary, you've got to understand in the dynamics, the way things happen, the fact that you're odd man out and agitating for a better deal brings everybody up the hill with you. And, and so it wasn't a negative that, <clears throat> that you were so acrimonious in what you thought was right. And, and so as a result of this, the entire Native community got a better deal out of Congress than it would have got otherwise. And secondly, after this was all said and done, the North Slope Borough did something very clever and I think John Havelock was Attorney General at the time, and there was a great deal of, of controversy over this. 
they wanted to set up a borough just like any other part of Alaska. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of opposition to that because they're going to, all those terrible people up north, they're going to tax the oil companies. Everybody's taxing the oil companies. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's what they did. They set up a borough that came at the problem another way. And, and, and which goes to show when, when you believe in a cause, you know, you may think that, well, we didn't win. But many times you turn around, my God, we did win. Now, I'll give you an example, uh, if I can, on the, the issue of sovereignty. Uh, when <clears throat> uh, early on, one of the first things, even before the land claims was coming up, uh, the Court of Indian Claims had awarded 7,500,000, I believe, to uh, see Alaska, or at that time it had another name. And so that was going to be, uh, it went through the Congress right. for the appropriation, and it was in conference, and both Ted and I were in the conference, and uh, the chairman, the subcommittee chairman on that side was Haley, who had been to jail over the Ringland Brothers, Barnum and Bailey situation. That's an interesting story. But he came from the city. Uh, that he went to jail for, and he got a, as soon as he got out of jail, he got elected to Congress. And he had been there for some time. He was subcommittee chairman. His name was Haley, and and so, and he wasn't very kind. He, he was he was a cracker from down south, so he wasn't very sympathetic. And one of the things was that we're going to give this money, but it's going to be under the IRA model, which is the federal government will make a determination how they spend their money and what they do with it. So you gotta go to Uncle Sam, Father, get blessed or you can't do it. This just wrangled me for some reason. I was just totally upset with that. And I personally believe if you have an inheritance, you're entitled to do what you want with it. You don't need the government to tell you how to do it. But that's the, that's the way we approached the native community. Oh, they're, they're, they're children. They don't really don't know what to do and we're gonna, we're gonna deal with them that way. In this conference, I proceeded to filibuster it. And I made myself so unbelievably obnoxious. Uh, and, and, and for three weeks, and, and usually a conference two or three days. And so lo and behold, John Bobridge comes to me. He says, Mike, you're killing us. We need this money. We're bleeding to death. Please stop what you're doing. You're stopping everything. Well, I, it was, I was so moved. Please. I said, okay, I'll give in, I'll fight this battle another day. Well, what happened was, that was so vitriolic an experience by all the key players, Jackson, Stevens, myself, and others, and, and the House members, <coughs> that the issue after that never came up again with respect to will the natives be able to control their land and their money without the government overseeing them. It, and here, I thought I lost. I was going to fight this again. But what happened? And I'll tell you just a slight vignette. I later, about four or five months later, I meet this Haley at a, at a cocktail party in the, in the House side. And he comes up to me, and he's a Democrat, I'm a Democrat. Stevens was a big Republican. So he comes up to me and he says, you know, that SOB Stevens, you know, who tied up the conference committee for three weeks, you know, I don't know how you can live with him. Now he's talking to me and he has this confused with Stevens and myself who did this. And when I look back at it, it I, I felt the failure at that point in time and was prepared to fight it again. Never had to fight it again. Okay. It was within the bowels of the Congress. This was so vitriolic an issue that it, nobody ever raised it again. Uh, <laughs> and so all I got to say is uh -huh. sometimes it looks like you lose, but yeah. you never know. You fight the good fight, and that's a win in itself, even if you don't think you win. We'll get back.